Hello, it's Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada, shooting from the Lugnuts facility. And uh, what we have uh, here today is a really interesting uh, vintage, uh, vintage car, 1959 Lancia Appia Zagato GTE. So this vehicle is, uh, is for sale. And uh, in this video, we'll do one of my customary longish videos on the car. Um, and we'll start out with uh, a brief history of the, the Lancia Appia, where it fits into the uh, Lancia model range, um, why it's a significant collector car, etc. There's, of course, more detailed and better sources for early Lancia information than me, but we'll at least uh, give the car a framework uh, in the video. And then we'll go on to this car, which has a terrific provenance, owned for 50 years by uh, a legendary American vintage racer, gentleman racer, uh, Toli Artinov, uh, who um, raced in Europe and in North America basically his whole adult life. Um, so uh, this car was sold on Bring a Trailer a couple of years ago and it went into a Calgary collection and now it is, uh, it is come free again. Um, so we'll do uh, an in-depth walk around on this car. Uh, we'll pay particular attention to the bodywork, paint, uh, undercarriage, engine bay. We'll go through all the um, chassis plates, uh, chassis number, engine numbers, etc. Uh, of the car. And uh, it's a survivor, um, never been restored, just repainted in its original colors. So um, this, is, this is a car that would definitely stir some debate as to um, whether to just leave it alone as a historic artifact or to restore it. I think, I think most people would agree that it's a, it's a preservation car. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll go through the car in, in depth and then we'll do, um, we'll have, a, we'll put it on the hoist. We'll take the wheels off. We'll have a look at the undercarriage. We'll examine, you know, the floor pans and, you know, all the nooks and crannies, uh, in, uh, in detail. We'll do a paint meter, uh, uh, video of the paint meter reports on all the panels. Um, so by the end of it, you know, prospective buyer will know exactly what they're buying. And then we'll finish it off with uh, a cold start and uh, a short driving video just to show you that uh, everything works. Okay. You're looking at a pretty rare and unique car. Also, it survived. Um, and it survived with it in its original colors and it's never been restored and doesn't look like it's ever been taken apart. Okay, so the engine was rebuilt um, at some point um, and it was painted, uh, but the paint looks like it's 25 years old um, and the interior is all original. So, and the car is, as we'll get to later in the video, unrusty. So we've got an unrusty original survivor of a rare coach-built Zagato car. Okay, so it's a pretty special piece. Okay, so the Lancia Appia was uh, Lancia's small car introduced in the early 50s and uh, replacing the pre-war Ardia. Um, it was, uh, it was a successful car. They made, uh, they made about 100,000 of the Appias and uh, was the custom, you know, they, they spun off, um, uh, you know, various versions of it and they sold the chassis to coach builders. And on the Appia chassis, there's everything from ambulances and sedans and coupes and convertibles, etc. Okay, so they made about 100,000 of the sedans and I think about 8,000 of the other variants. And of that 8,000, around 5,000 went to coach builders. And most of the coach built cars were more uh, a luxury uh, a luxury variant in, in coupes and convertibles. Um, I think mostly by Pininfrina. Um, Zagato bodied Appia is accounted for, I think about 700 of them. And about uh, 300 of those were GTEs. So they made, they made a, a similar car to this, I think from 57 to 63. To just understand exactly what we have here in terms of chassis number and so forth, we, were, we can consult some reference books. Um, uh, now these books are, are are mine and not included in the sale, but this a very specific one I'll digitize and uh, and somebody can have that in a PDF form. So we have the La Lancia book by uh, Wiernink. Um, I have this mostly a coffee table book by Nada Zagato, um, and then I have this very specific run of 
25 books on the Appia Zagato. It looks like it was done by a club member in 1989, and I've got the letter from a Natalie uh, from Jeff Burke, who um, looks like put this very, very specific um, book together on all the Zagato Appia variants, including listing all the chassis numbers. Okay, so let's just, we can back up a little bit here um, to Zagato, the coach builder, um, who in the 50s would have made custom bodies for Aston Martin, the DB4 GT Zagato, Fiat 8V, Maserati A6G, Ferrari 250 GT, and then for the smaller displacement cars, the the uh, Appia GT Zagato, which is our car, and also versions of the Alfa Romeo Giulietta and the Fiat Abarth uh, uh, as well. Okay, they even did a Bristol. So we can see the five different versions of the Zagato coachwork on the Appia mm -hmm. chassis here um, in this uh, reference book, uh, La Lancia by uh, Wiernink, which is an excellent book. And uh, we can see it started out with uh, the double bubble roof and these American fins. And then they finally kind of rationalized production on the, uh, as a GTE, which is our car here. And then the uh, latest versions uh, had uh, uncovered headlights. And I believe the rule changes in Italy uh, mandated that, okay? So to make sense of, of, of the production volumes, of each of these variants and the dates and so forth. Um, we need to separate the versions of the Appia chassis and the versions of the Zagato coachwork. So the Appia chassis was made from, from 53 to 63 and there's five different series of the Appia chassis, each with you know mechanical differences. Um, and then we have uh, five different versions of the Zagato coachwork on the Appia chassis, but there's different versions of the GTE, for instance, um, uh, that don't match entirely with the change in the chassis. So it's a little bit confusing, but to make sense of that, we'll go to this reference book. And um, well, first of all, we can see the line drawings of these cars, the GTZ and GT, the GTE 1, the GTE 2, and the Lancia Sport, okay? And then here is a list in 1989 of all the known VINs of those cars. So they made, you know, unconfirmed one prototype, and then they made, uh, they believe, but they don't have the data for, 75 of these cars with the fins, And then they kind of settle into a GTE production, um, but a couple things happen during the GTE production. The uh, chassis gets updated. So the chassis that, there's a picture of the Appia sedan. There's a picture of the chassis, which is then sold to Zagato. So then midway through the GTE production, the chassis changes and Lanch is now buying a series three Appia chassis instead of a series two. And I believe the major difference was the, was the dual circuit brakes. This book, this book will tell you, it's in there somewhere. Um, so that leaves us with the first batch of maybe 75 GT and GTZs, followed by what we call GTE ones. And the GTE ones are our car, this car, and they have covered headlights. And then the, then the, the, the road regulations change and they have the second version of the GTE, which they denote a GTE 2, and it has a different front end and grill treatment and different lights, okay? So we have GTE 1s and 2s, and then we finish off with the, uh, the, the GT, or just the Lancia Sport, Zagato Sport, okay. So, uh, and this reference book in 1989 shows us 587 cars, Zagato coachwork cars and Appia chassis. Uh, Wikipedia shows us 731, but in this 1989 book, it, it does 
say that it's an incomplete due to the lack of data, okay? So I think 731 is probably the number that is most accurate. Now, our car is 2533. This means it's a, uh, you know, the, the Series 1 GTE. And when they first started making GTEs, it was the Series 2 Appia chassis, okay? So the first 31 of those cars, of which ours is included, were on the Series 2 Appia chassis. Then the chassis updated. Now Zagato is buying Series 3 Zagato, or sorry, Series 3 Appia chassis, but they're still making a GTE 1. They're still putting the same body on the chassis. The only difference is the chassis has some differences. Okay, so we have 31 of the GTE 1s, and then we have 136 of the uh, GTE 1s on the Appia 3 chassis. Okay, so that's what, that's what it means when it says GTE S2, first version of the GTE on the second version of the Appia chassis, 31 of those, that's ours. Then they keep making the same body, it's visually identical, but now it's a GTE 1 on the later Appia chassis, so GTE Series 3, they made 136 of those. The GTE 1s are visually identical, both these have the covered headlights. So if you are looking for a uh, Lancia Zagato Appia uh, with covered headlights, it's gonna be either the 31 or the 136, so 167 total, okay? Um, and then there's about 300 of the GTEs in total. So, so I, think, I think that the takeaway is that this is one of 160 cars that look like this. Um, one of 31 cars from the Series 2 chassis, which look the same as the other 130 cars on the Series 3 chassis. And then there is uh, other versions of a GTE, another 150 or so cars, which are similar, but with exposed headlights. And then there are another approximately 300 cars that are Zagato body cars on Appia chassis, but look a little bit different, okay? And then the Lancia Sports have a different wheelbase. So one of about 700 Zagato bodied cars on Appia chassis, one of about 300 uh, GTEs, um, one of about 160 that look like this with covered headlights, and of the 160, one of 31 built on the Series 2 Appia chassis. And I really hope that's not too confusing because it's kind of confusing to me. But like I said, I'll digitize this book and include it with the sale. And then it has everything from advertisements to, you know, the minute of the differences. And, uh, and this will go with the car. The history and provenance of this car uh, is interesting and impressive. Um, firstly, it was, it was designed by Vittorio Jano, and Jano was the designer of the famous uh, Alfa Romeo Grand Prix cars, pre-war, the 1750, 60, 1750, and 8C cars, and designed the Lancia road and race cars of the uh, uh, 1950s. Okay. Um, then we have a Zagato body. Um, you know, some of the most uh, valuable sports racing cars in the world were Zagato body. Uh, Zagato had an early aviation um, uh, expertise and, and applied those aerodynamics and lightweight construction to the road cars and made a great deal of the, uh, you know, most winning Grand Prix cars in the you know, 30s and, and, and 1950s, okay? So then we have the car coming to North America, and this was one of um, five cars, uh, the first five Appia Zagatos that came to North America were imported by Max Hoffman, who was the famous New York-based importer and also 
the um, he had such influence that he asked Porsche for a lightweight 356, and that became a speedster. Uh, he wanted BMW to do a prestige uh, a sports car, and that became the BMW 507. He even lined up the designer uh, goats for the for the 507, and he placed an order. He drove the Mercedes 194 uh, Gullwing race car, and then convinced Mercedes he, with an order of a thousand cars, 500 coupes and 500 roadsters, and that became a Mercedes 198 coupe. Uh, Gullwing and Roadster. So Max Hoffman was an uh, incredibly influential and important figure in the uh, importation of European cars in the 1950s and at one time had, you know, uh, was the importer for Volkswagen, Jaguar, Mercedes, Lancia, BMW, you name it. Um, so this was one of the first five Lancia Zagatos that Max Hoffman imported and sold. And then it made its way to uh, Tolly Artinov in the uh, in the 70s. And Tolly, uh, a gentleman driver, American gentleman driver, who uh, was basically raced race cars his whole his whole life in Europe and in the U.S. Um, and would have known and and hung out with you know all the great uh, Grand Prix drivers of the era, uh, certainly all the American ones, uh, Phil Hill, Dan Gurney, you know, Richie Kinther, etc. So then Tolly, uh, who is now in his mid 80s, uh, listed the car and bring a trailer a couple of years ago, and it wound up in um, a Calgary collection alongside a really wonderful group of um, small displacement Italian post-war sports cars, Fiat Abarths and Moretti's and such. Um, the owner of which um, distinguished himself by almost winning, I mean second, uh, at the Pebble Beach Concours with a post-war car that he uh, restored himself in his garage at home doing all of his own work including paint and upholstery and metalwork and everything else so um, it's it's had a couple of good homes although the last one only for a few years and so the um, and to answer and to answer the obvious question why would the current owner sell it and all of his cars are beyond perfect and um, he didn't want to restore it. it, it it's, this is a, should, in his opinion, be left as a preservation car and so it just didn't quite fit his collection. So uh, he's had it for a couple of years and um, poked around it a little bit and got it running probably, did a few things to it, but, but it doesn't really fit in um, what else he's trying to do. And he's got, he says he's got one more car that he wants to do. And so he's looking for a full restoration. Okay, so that's why it's up on the market. Um, but we have a car with some pretty impressive credentials, uh, both from uh, what it is and who designed it, who imported it, and then uh, the virtually complete ownership history. I guess missing the first 20 years, but uh, 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 ownership history going back 50 years. Uh, now let's get to the uh, actual condition of the car and we can start with a slow walk around uh, inside and out and we'll do a paint meter reading of it and then we can put it on the hoist okay so I, I, I was looking through the notes a little bit more and uh, there is a reference to the car being painted in 1978 uh, which, uh, you know, makes sense uh, looking at the uh, stress cracks and so on in the paint. So let's just go, let's just go through it. The body is very straight though, um, although the, the paint is crazed. I'm not picking up any uh, dents in the alloy coachwork at all, which is kind of unusual for a car that's been vintage raced for the last 40 years. Um, so the sides look, that door's not closed properly. Interesting, these, these um, uh, door handle mechanisms were common um, for all the uh, Zagato cars and uh, very similar to what was on a, a 300 SL as well. Gullwing and Roadster. Okay, so the, the sides look very straight. Uh, I do see one one small dent here. And other than that, I really don't see any dents in the alloy at all. I think 
that is just a stress crack. I don't believe that there's a dent there. It's the same on this side. Bumpers aren't dented. So yeah, I'm, I'm only seeing one small dent on the driver's lower driver's fender. Uh, there's some, I mean, it's, it's really hard to tell, but it looks, the body looks very straight. Uh, door gaps for a car that's never been apart, never been rusted, never had sills, you know, replaced, never had invasive um, metal work. You'd expect the doors, the shut lines of the doors, the hood and the bonnet to be good. And, uh, and they are. So many of these cars, you know, have had uh, significant rust repair and uh, very, it's very difficult to get the, uh, the doors to, uh, to get the shut lines back where they were. Um, and the hood shut line. Is also excellent. You can see that the, the trailing edge is raised a little bit for ventilation. Uh, door shut on the driver's side. And again, that's excellent. I mean, so often you see the, the bottoms of the doors, you know, sit proud of the rest of the bodywork and, you know, misaligned. So it's, it's uh, quite unusual to see a car this vintage with, um, with excellent shut lines, okay? And the trunk. and the filler cap. All are excellent. The opening and closing of the doors is also excellent. Okay, um, the trim, the, uh, the aluminum trim on the car would be difficult to source and replace so we can make sure that it's all there and in good shape. And it is, the windscreen surround. Is all in nice shape. The side windows, we have these plexiglass fairings. There's a little crack on the edge of that. Uh, but the aluminum is in nice shape. And there's trim on the inside of the rear quarter window and it's all there and it's all in uh, all in all in beautiful shape okay um, the wipers well there is some pitting in the chrome as you would expect there was a reference I think in the bad auction that only one of the nozzles was present, so another one has been sourced since then. Uh, the covered headlamps, uh, there is a little piece missing there, um, but both the uh, plastic covers are intact. We can see that there's the original Lucas lights that are still in place. Um, and the uh, front fog lights or uh, marker lights have a little bit of crazing on them and the front bumper a little bit of pitting uh, but not actually too bad it's the Appia GTE um, badge which is a nice shape the, uh, the inner grill that aluminum surround is a uh, nice shape not dented the grill doesn't have any bent, uh, you know, bent portions. It's in nice shape. It's a little bit discolored. Um, the logo is a little bit pitted. And we can see some of the rubber starting to deteriorate there. But uh, the tiny little ping on the underside of the bumper there. But actually, and, uh, it's got a couple, I suppose. A couple small marks on the front bumper, as you might expect. Zagato badge and, and those, those are in nice shape. 
It looks to be a bit of wear there, but nice shape, not too bad. And the rear bumper. It's a little bit of pitting. I don't see any dents in the rear bumper. Not sure about that exhaust tip. It doesn't look to be original, but I'm not authority on that. Um, tail light bezel, some slight pitting. Glass looks okay. The lenses are unbroken. And uh, same on the tail light there. Just a little bit of pitting, but the uh, the glass is intact. Okay. Not much trim on a Zagato bodied car, um, but what they're but importantly, I think uh, you know all the pieces are. Present. The tires were Michelin XAS 155-15s. They were new in, I believe it was 2016 that they were new. And we have some light pitting on the hubcaps and wheel trims, but, uh, but uh, no dents. And they look appropriate with the wear of the rest of the car. Now the paint itself is 40 years old and we can see it's a, a repaint of the original color um, uh, which is white and you can see it cracking you know throughout so um, there's stress cracks uh, you know, throughout I'm not even sure if it's stress cracks just uh, the material shrunk and cracked uh, throughout. If there were major sins in the body after 40 years, you would see it with bubbling and filler coming off, etc. So the fact that it's 40 years old and there's no obvious uh, signs of corrosion uh, is uh, comforting, okay? But uh, you can see it. So you get the idea. It is it is quite uniform though. There's no panel that's uh, better or worse than the other. I think that is a little bit of a crease down there. Caught something. And uh, there's a couple tiny little, just seeing it in the light, little door dings. But really, I didn't even see those before. I had to get them in the right light to even notice them. That would come out with paintless dent removal. Okay. So I think that walk around gives you a fair idea of what the paint looks like. And now we can actually measure it with um, my paint meter here and we can go through it. So this is set up in micrometers, which is one one hundredth of a uh, millimeter. So factory, like new car paint, I expect 200 micrometers and to repaint, you know, something in the three, four, fives and sixes. If there's any, any filler at all, you know, you get up to, or, or a primer that's thick, you get up to maybe a thousand, uh, uh, 1200 micrometers or about 1.2 millimeters. So what, it's a very sensitive device. So what you're looking for is consistency um, and, uh, you know, no wild, uh, uh, no wild differences or worse places where um, nothing comes through at all because that tells you that there's too much filler for it even to record. Okay, so we're getting threes, fours, and fives. Uh, 
There's the odd rogue reading. Um, that's kind of just the way the um, device is situated on the paint, okay? So all of that is pretty consistent. And consistent with the repaint. Um, if the car is rusty, often it's the, like the lower fenders which go first. And so there's no filler in that at all. There's always going to be variations. It's a very sensitive device. You know, we're only talking, you know, tenths of a millimeter here. Let's check the door. Bottoms of the doors are also trouble spots on many cars. Also, the way the paint is laid on, you know, it, it'll flow down and then you'll get thicker readings um, on different parts of the curvature of the body, uh, depending on how the paint was laid on. So you're looking for big discrepancies, not, not tenths of a millimeter. It's nice to see uniform paint along these taillights because that would be difficult to uh, fix if it were hit. Again, depending on how flush the meter is on the paint, sometimes you can get a single rogue reading. So try to take the average of a, a, group, a group of readings in an area rather than a single reading.
So there could have been a small dent in this area. Again, we're only talking, we're not even up to a, milli a millimeter, but uh, slightly more filler in this area. Uh, probably just a dent. And it looks like in this area too, there was another dent. Again, we're still not up to even one millimeter. So we're talking a very, a very light skim. You don't, you don't want to find big variations on the roof. <laughs> it's never a good sign. Front bonnet. Sorry if this is a little bit tedious, but for the person who wants to buy the car, I would really like to know what's under the paint. So this is the best way to do it. Underneath the car. You see this line right there? It looks like um, some fresher paint was blown in on the nose than exists on the 1978 paint. So um, it looks like we, we've got a repaint in 1978, and you can see it's crazing all over. And then we've got, uh, it looks like the nose was redone, and we can see the line there and there. And that does explain why we've got slightly higher paint meter readings on the nose in the 7s and 8s versus the 3s and 4s. And the reason for that is because anything forward of this line is going to have three layers of paint instead of the two layers of paint that are there. Okay, So I'm not sure if it was done for stone ships or whatever it does. There's no evidence of any uh, of it being crashed or any dents in it, but the paint is a little bit thicker because it just has more layers of paint. You know, just about all the, me all the paint meter readings, uh, you know, within a few tenths of a millimeter, and there's only a couple of areas in the car and mostly on the passenger door where there's even just a light skim so this is a really especially for an aluminum bodied car that has been vintage raced this is a, a really exceptionally straight uh, rust-free and damage-free 
body. And that's, that's of course, anybody who's ever restored a car will know that uh, that is the uh, that is the most expensive thing to deal with is the bodywork. So the, the body on this car is excellent. Floors are excellent. We'll go underneath as well and poke around down there, um, which I've done already, and it's, it's basically the same as the, as the top side. It's a, it's a virtually rust-free example. So let's go inside. Very, really lovely, uh, lovely door handles. Well, um, I won't need to convince anybody. This is the original leather. Of course, you just can't buy leather like this anymore. We've got some fairly advanced uh, deterioration. Uh, you know, but actually, there's actually there's firms in the UK that can, you know, they put new, um, they put new uh, seat foam in it. Um, and they save the leather. So it's, it's just got a wonderful patina on it. Um, uh, and uh, that leather, I believe, could be stabilized and with new foam on it to keep, to keep the appearance, but to keep it from wearing further. You can see the door panel. Again, this is an original interior car with sort of the signature Zagato alloy door handles and so on. And um, uh, beautiful uh, blue and white vinyl. Uh, the period uh, Nardi wood rim. So we have the dash which is uh, uncracked. And a little bit of uh, I'm not sure what that is but the uh, the vinyl is uh, is uncracked and it looks like it's a it's a metal uh, dash not uh, there's no there's no foam in there and we see some sort of light uniform pitting on all of the different uh, interior trims. We have these, you know, these aluminum, you know, these, this aluminum trim. We see that also in the engine compartment and in various places uh, around the car. Uh, the uh, gauges uh, all uh, look good. Again, a little bit of pitting on the bezels, uh, but the gauges themselves, the numerals and so on, uh, look good. Uniform pitting on the, um, on the direction indicator. And uh, all the trim pieces are intact. Some, you know, rust on some of these metal fittings. Um, all the original fasteners and the headliner, bows and the headliner are all, uh, are all there. Um, this piece was new. It wasn't when the car was bought from Bring a Trailer, when Totally had it. There was a roll bar in the back and that was been removed. So the owner then just made up this, um, uh, made up this alloy separator with a vinyl covering. Um, we can see the um, uh, rear compartment here. A little bit of rust starting because of the deterioration of the window sill on both sides, but doesn't look too bad. And all the original parts are there. Original parcel shelf. Again, all original fittings. Um, we have uh, <laughs> this yellow cord is so you can find the choke because it's just buried up in there. And, uh, <laughs> that's uh, so you can find it. Um, so the pedals show some honest wear, and uh, the floor the floor is excellent. There's no there's nothing soft in the floor at all. Front or rear uh, drivers or passenger. You can see the rear floor as well. Okay. Seat belts are a later, a, a later addition, as is the uh, as is the fire extinguisher. Go to the other side. Floor is excellent. So a completely original interior, all of the trim pieces intact, um, all of the pieces serviceable. There's nothing broken. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, it's it's a wonderful a wonderful survivor.
Okay, so let's have a look underneath this Lancia. Uh, when the car was auctioned on bringing a trailer, uh, there were no undercarriage shots, um, or, or at least just ones from ground level, and it was like full of cobwebs. And I think pe people asked in the auction, um, you know, how rusty was the underside, and uh, I think totally just, just replied that it was just surface rust. So I think, I, think, I think most of that auction was basically a love letter to Anatoly Artinov, and, and not much was actually <laughs> um, spent talking about the car. So here, you know, we've uh, got the car on the hoist, we've got the wheels off, and it's well lit, and uh, I pressure washered the underside of the car, uh, and now we can get a really clear uh, picture of what's underneath, and I can go through all the nooks and crannies and so on, and... Uh, the next owner will know exactly what they're buying. I think that when the current owner bought this from Bring a Trailer, you know, he really took a little bit of a, a, a flyer because he had, you know, surface rust can mean just about anything. And in those photographs, there was like cobwebs hanging down and so on. So anyway, what have we got here? Well, um, we can see the, uh, the finned aluminum uh, brake drums, uh, nice uh, bronze um, uh, wheel nuts. Uh, we can see the, uh, the sliding pillar suspension, which was a Lancia staple. I think they came out with that in the 20s or maybe even the teens. When they put it in this car in 1959, I, I think it was 25 or 30 years old already. Uh, okay, so fairly conventional steering. And then we've got, the, we've got this interesting transverse... Um, uh, support for the suspension and there is a chassis tag there we can read it and it says it's a c10s and a 30705 so that's for the for the chassis Let's see if i can get that for you here's a better picture of that okay so we have the finned aluminum sump um, and all the lower fins are, uh, are, uh, are in nice shape. It looks like we have one piece that's missing from the front. Must have caught something. Uh, okay, and uh, we have braided um, brake lines, which were, of course, a later addition. And uh, we have, you can see, the steering linkage. Um, the bottom of the alloy body uh, looks nice and straight. And uh, I'm sure this is just where, you know, that's how the car was made, uh, where the body was dropped on the chassis and then, and then sort of hand beaten and attached to the, uh, the chassis there. Okay. Uh, we can see the, uh, the gearbox um, and exhaust. There's some... I don't know what, what exactly that is, some sort of heat shielding material that is over top the exhaust in between it and the body. And that is deteriorating a little bit. And we have this really robust uh, handbrake assembly. <laughs> and why a, uh, I don't know, 1800 pound car needs that, I don't know, but uh, typical Lancia over engineering. And we see these neat donuts on the, uh, on the drive shaft, again, another, Interesting piece. Uh, I'm sure the exhaust tip's not original. Uh, and then we have the well for the spare tire and the fuel tank, which uh, takes up most of the trunk. Okay, well, those are those are cast iron. So we've got fin drums on the front, and uh, and uh, steel drums on the rear. And there we go. Now I can go through it slow more slowly here's the back of the engine drain plug you see it's wired and uh, this extra wire here is for an additional wire for the throttle return spring and that's wired so that must have been part of the race regulations okay so that's the mechanical layout and now let's take a real good look at um at the state of the chassis and the body. So we can see, you know, there's no, doesn't appear to be any corrosion up in the wheel wells here. 
Um, we see this is this is a well, that's a fender liner, and that is the undercoating, and we can see it's a little bit soft there. Okay, so there's a little bit soft in this lining piece. Um, on the other side, the front looks good. And in this wheel well, you know, all this is solid. It's, you know, the jacking point underneath here is all solid. And it looks all pretty good. It looks like a little bit of some rust that's starting in this. And this must be where water has accumulated. So that's a localized spot, I think, just where the water pooled. But it's solid everywhere else. That's just that's just a triangle that uh, you could weld in if you if you wanted to. Okay, and let's have a look at the floors, and all of this is solid. So that's the noise you want to hear. And suspension mounting points is all solid. All the metal in there is all solid, okay? So these critical areas where, you know, the chassis, and that's just flaked on undercoating, so it's all solid in there. So, um, and again, all of this is good. And around the front, It's all solid. Okay, it's the inner floor, and that's all solid too. Okay, uh, other side, and it's all solid metal. suspension mounting point there's no soft metal there at all okay uh, behind let's do the rear rear arches okay that's all solid and again the rear arches are all solid okay back in here all looks pretty good. There's no evidence of um, soft metal or corrosion or electrolytic corrosion. It's all um, it's all good. The fuel tank has been drained, and it's all solid. Spare tire well. Nothing soft in there. And that's the, uh, the rear passenger side wheel arch. So anything that's brown is just brown metal. There's no, there's no corrosion. So really, the only corrosion that uh, I found, and I poked around this uh, car quite a bit, the only corrosion that I found is this corner uh, where the water pools in between the fender liner and this uh, under tray, okay? So there's that bit there, a couple inches by maybe one inch. Everything else is solid around it. So that is just a localized piece. And then a little bit of this um, 
a little bit of this fender liner right there. And that's it. So it is quite remarkable for a 60s, well, 50s Italian car uh, to uh, never having been apart, never having been restored, and really, for all intent and purposes, never, never having any significant or material rust. So the underside is very, very uh, straight. It's complete with all these, you know, um, underbody um, panels, and uh, there is no damage, uh, you know, to the, the vulnerable um, you know, aluminum uh, nose cone. And uh, the outriggers, the sills, you know, all that, uh, all that looks excellent. Okay, and then because of that, it's never been apart, and uh, that means that the door fit is original as well. Something that's very hard to uh, to get right when you have to cut a, cut a car apart to replace the rust. Okay, so that is the underside. Okay, so uh, now we'll do the cold start video. So the vehicle's been in uh, lug nuts for about a week. Uh, we haven't started it, we've pushed it inside. Uh, so we're gonna start it uh, for the first time. It's about uh, 12 or 13 degrees Celsius, and uh, we'll start the car up. We'll let you listen to the engine run for a while, and then we'll take it for a short drive. We don't have it insured for the road, so we'll just take a spin around the parking lot, but at least, um, we can demonstrate that uh, everything works properly, okay? The radiator was found to be leaking, so it was uh, taken out and rebuilt, and all of the rubber hoses uh, were replaced because they were starting to deteriorate. Okay, so I do have this uh, handy book about uh, how to turn the lights on, and uh, we'll try to figure out what these uh, identical <laughs> five mystery knobs do. Um, we have the choke, which is rather difficult to find uh, on the bottom of the dash, and so the owner currently <laughs> put a, a long, a long uh, piece of ribbon on it. Uh, so we'll fire the car up, and then Dale will show you what's going out of the tailpipe. And I don't know exactly how much choke to use, so I'm just going to guess. Um, but uh, we'll we'll turn it over now, and then we can see what comes out of the tailpipe.
bark to it, doesn't it? Yeah, snappy throttle response. I wonder how you balance, like it's like an 11 degree V4. I wonder how you balance that. All right, and so, um, any guesses where reverse is? <laughs> uh, get any noise from the release bearing on the clutch so if I put it in a neutral and let out the clutch if the release bearing is going you kind of hear that it's fairly common and the gearbox is very very tight huh like it's only there's only maybe an inch between the ratios in the um, in the uh, between the planes of the gearbox so that's first gear The brake, to be fair, the brakes are a little bit soft, I would say, uh, but they still stop the car. Synchros are good. And the steering is tight. Right, there you have it a quite a little snappy car um the gearbox is excellent clutch is excellent throttle response is excellent brakes are a little soft you know i'd say i'd say before you put it on the track uh you, you probably want to go through those but uh steering's nice and sharp suspension's good you can tell it uh handles beautifully it's a lot of fun to drive so um so that'll wrap up this uh part of the video it runs it starts it drives it's fun lightweight italian car Okay, there you have it, 1959 Lancia Appia Zagato 
GTE, uh, bought by Toli Artinov in uh, the early 70s, repainted uh, sometime in the late 70s, 1978, I think. The, the engine was rebuilt you know, in around that area. It was vintage raced uh, through the uh, 80s and 90s by uh, Mr. Artinoff, uh, sold and bring a trailer, I think in 2021, picked up by a, a well-known Calgary uh, collector of uh, small displacement uh, Italian sports cars. Um, and, uh, and, now, and now offered for sale. So we have a, we have a, a true survivor, um, a car that's only had an engine rebuilt and a repaint. And everything else looks original. It's in the original colors. Uh, it's one of um, 31 covered headlight uh, Series 1 Appia Zagato GTEs, uh, one of a few hundred GTEs, uh, and uh, you know, one of a few thousand Zagato bodied cars from the heyday of uh, sports car racing uh, in, the, in the 50s and 60s. Um, we have ownership, uh, ownership uh, from a famous gentleman racer, uh, Mr. Artinoff. Uh, from the 1970s, complete history. We have uh, we have the original manuals and so forth. We have log books from the vintage racing meets. Um, we have it thoroughly vetted by um, you know uh, an expert in these type of cars with with the current owner. It sadly just doesn't fit his his collection objectives right now, and so it's being uh, it's being sold. When you buy one of these one of these cars, you have to you know obviously you know it's got to fit into your own objectives what you're going to do with it, but. You know, a lot of cars aren't that suited for driving on the street. There's cars that can't keep up with traffic. There's cars that are hot and noisy and cranky, unreliable, you know, that you can't really uh, drive that much. Um, so with this car, you know, from the 50s, you have something that's enclosed. It's a coupe. It's got a heater. It's got a ventilation. There's windscreen wipers. It's comfortable. It's reliable. Mr. Mr. Artinoff drove it from Oklahoma to Monterey and back again, you know, for the historic races. Um, it will uh, happily keep up with traffic. The, the low weight and uh, skinny tires and, and, uh, and uh, aerodynamic body means that it doesn't need a lot of power to maintain highway speeds. It's not revving excessively high. Um, so you can, you can take this thing and drive it. Obviously, it's, it's not a concourse car, <clears throat> so you don't have to worry about a paint scratch or, or a rock chip on it. So you can use the car, um, you can be comfortable driving in the car, and then the car has so many great stories to tell. So it occurred to me that, um, you know, this car is probably one degree of separation, um, and, and, and that, I think that comes from a play where it hypothesizes that, that every person has six degrees of separation from every other person on the planet. Well, this car is one degree of separation from all the great 50s and 60s racing car drivers, all the great coach builders, all the great designers, all the, you know, it, it's one degree of separation away from just about everything that is cool and important in, you know, our, our collector car hobby. Um, so I think it, 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 you know, it, it, you know, if the car could speak, it, it could speak uh, volumes. So this is, um, I, you know, I think a really terrific opportunity to, to own something that, you know, is usable and that you can have fun with um, and, uh, you know, enter into events and so on and, and drive places, uh, use the car, um, but then also have something with some real historical uh, provenance and great stories to tell. So the, the whole experience of, of owning the car, driving the car, talking about the car, etc., cetera, um, you know, seems to me, um, you know, something that would be uh, very worthwhile and that would create uh, all kinds of great uh, memories for the for the new owner which is really what what this hobby is all about so with that i'll leave you uh thank you for watching the long video uh lawrence romanowski from calgary canada please like and subscribe my channel and uh and this uh vehicle will be for sale out of calgary alberta uh in the uh coming weeks or months okay thank you very much